1972, Gene Heller of the Associated Press broke the story of Tuskegee to the nation. She wrote four hard-hitting articles. And in the wake of that expose, Americans started talking about how this could happen in the United States. For those of you who are not familiar with the Tuskegee study, let me give you just a quick, or a quick overview. From 1932 until 1972, tick them off, four decades, 40 years. The United States Public Health Service, our United States Public Health Service, conducted a study of untreated syphilis in a group of African American men in Macon County, Alabama. For 40 years, they conducted a death watch to see how long and by what complications the illness would ravage those men and kill many of them. And they did so arguing to the person that it was good science and good medicine. And the people who didn't understand the experiment really should keep their mouth shut because they, the physicians conducting it, knew that it was good science and good medicine. When I went to work on this experiment, being a historian, I wanted to try to put it in historical context. So I began to look at the broad issue of race and medicine. The question I asked myself, how do racial attitudes affect the perception that physicians have of illness in a different race? white physicians regarding African Americans. And how does race alter the response that physicians give to disease, white physicians to black patients? So to answer that question, I went back to the 19th century. And I looked at an amazing uh, volume of writing that physicians did about their black patients. And it's an instructive essay in how racial attitudes just completely distort perception. Because when they wrote about African Americans, they could not separate their racist attitudes from the disease that they were seeing. And so race conflates every line they wrote. And if you look at syphilis as an example of a disease, it really has a whammy effect. It just multiplies everything because it plunges white physicians into their stereotypes of black sexuality. So if you look at that literature in the late 19th century, what it says is that all African Americans have syphilis. It's just almost a, a, a blanket statement. 95% is the figure you see quoted frequently. The second thing that you read is that you can't do anything about syphilis in black people. Why? Because one, they can't control their libidos, and two, they're too stupid to show up for treatment. Those are the two things you see in the literature. When I read that literature, I said, I've got it. I understand now. The Tuskegee syphilis experiment comes from a group of racist doctors blood dripping from their fangs, the very incarnation of bigoted, evil people. Well, the problem with preconceived notions is that if you continue to do research, you have to test them against what you find. And what I found was the story was much more complicated. Instead of a simple morality play of good and evil, black and white, it became a cautionary tale of why people who consider themselves perfectly good can sin for the best of reasons. The Tuskegee syphilis experiment really has its background, its backdrop in the progressive era. A remarkable period of reform dating roughly from 1890 to 1920 when Americans begin to look at the transformations of our society, they looked at industrialization, they looked at urbanization, they looked at immigration, the three great things changing the United States in the late 19th century. And they looked at the cost of uh, unregulated industry, of water that was getting foul, of air that you couldn't breathe. Does any of this sound vaguely familiar today about deregulation? Uh, 
What they tried to do was begin to take tally of the cost of that society and to begin to address particular issues and make discrete reforms. One of those areas involved public health. And the leader of the public health service, or the leader of the public health movement, was really kind of a coalition between government and philanthropic foundations. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation in particular was a major player. Their medical division attacked hookworm and pellagra and other diseases in the South. Uh, but there was a smaller foundation called the Rosenwald Fund. And the Rosenwald Fund was established by Julius Rosenwald, who was the child of Jewish immigrants. Uh, he had a particular soft spot in his heart for African Americans because he thought that they had gotten a raw deal and that the society that oppressed them really should do a better job by them. So he started putting his money into building schools in the rural South. There is uh, a Supreme Court decision, Plessy versus Ferguson, that says separate but equal, and that was supposed to apply to schools. It didn't. The schools for African Americans were not existent, subpar, or just terrible. So Rosenwald built schools, but when he built the schools, he discovered that the kids who came to them were malnourished, many of them suffering from diseases, and he asked himself, what good does it do you know, to educate a child who's not going to live beyond uh, childhood? So he started thinking about public health. And he got a guy named Michael M. Davis, who was a pioneer in the field of public health. He had a PhD actually in economics, but was also a sociologist in his soul. And he was the head of the dispensary movement in Boston. So he knew a lot about blue-collar urban health problems with the Irish. But he really didn't know a lot about African-American health in the South. So when Davis was appointed to be the director of this new division in this small foundation, not much money to work with, he went to the public health service and said, loan me an officer who knows something about black health problems. Let me put him on my staff, let him serve as an advisor, and let me do what I can with the money I have to address these problems. So the person who was seconded to the public health service was this gentleman. His name is Tolliver Clark. Clark was a Virginian. He was an MD. He was the head of the VD division of the United States Public Health Service. He had a long and distinguished career in public health. And he thought that syphilis was the most important public health problem facing African Americans in the South. The reason he thought that was that pellagra and hookworm, and the other two scourges, had been largely addressed by the Rockefeller Foundation. Syphilis was the leftover disease. But also he thought that because he was a true believer. If you look at the public health service, it was organized around disease models. There was tuberculosis, there were other diseases, and all those officers to the person would tell you that their division worked on the most important disease. So they had great esprit de corps. They thought what they were doing was great. Clark wanted to do something about syphilis. So he whispers in the ear of Michael M. Davis, Davis whispers in the ear of Julius Rosenwald, and they put some money together, and they start a program. The program they start is, first of all, to collect information. They went into six different southern states, six different communities, each chosen on the basis of presenting a different demographic profile of the conditions under which African Americans lived, and they went into those communities with a Wasserman dragnet. They tested people randomly in order to ascertain the degree or amount of syphilis, the case studies, the case numbers. I won't go into all six uh, states, but I'll tell you two of them. One bookend was Abermarle County, Virginia, the home of the University of Virginia, which happened to have, by the way, a very good free public clinic operated by the University of Virginia. In Abermarle County, they discovered that about 7% of the African-American population had syphilis. That figure compared not unfavorably with national for the general population, which were put at the time at four to five percent. At the other extreme was Macon County, Alabama, 
the home of the famed Tuskegee Institute, Booker T. Washington School. And there, they found a whopping 35% of the population tested had syphilis. But of that 35%, 62%, more than half, had congenital syphilis. So the disease was simply not, you know, endemic, or, or excuse me, uh, epidemic. It was endemic. It was inbred in the population and spoke to generations of medical neglect. Clark then, uh, now that he had some data on these six different southern states, he went back with a team of physicians with mobile clinics and they treated the patients who had syphilis with the treatments of choice. Those were arsenicals, neoars, fetalmen, and mercury by inunction. They did this for about 14 months and then they wrote up their, their, their data, their, their studies. What they found was that African Americans, if you used techniques of modern epidemiology, the follow-up workers, getting them to come in for treatment, that they were just as cooperative as whites and that the disease was just as treatable in African Americans as it was with whites. So what comes out of this are a series of articles published in state health journals, a great uh, self-congratulatory cry of we can do this. It was meant really, those demonstrations, the Rosenwald Fund demonstrations, were meant to kind of shame southern states into appropriating money for this health issue within their boundaries. What happened though was that in 1929 the stock market collapsed, the money that was going into these Rosenwald Fund treatment programs dried up, and the, the Rosenwald Fund was basically caught short for money. So what had been a pioneering and very uh, beneficial program suddenly has no money. Okay, that's the backdrop for the Tuskegee study. It's not evil. It's people wanting to do good. Tolliver Clark, though, had it in his head that, okay, we have new information, we've got people out there in the field. Wouldn't it be nice to take one of those communities and study syphilis? And the community he chose was Macon County, Alabama, Tuskegee, which is the county seat. And he chose it because it had the highest incidence of syphilis, that 35%. And he chose it also because it had the Tuskegee Institute Hospital there, the John A. Andrew Hospital, which was a model, okay, for, you know, clinical workups. Uh, he had a problem. How do you sell this? How do you sell studying a disease instead of treating it? Well, first of all, you have to come up with explanations why you want to do it. He said he wanted to do it for two reasons. One, that there was a study in Scandinavia, the Oslo study, which had been done on whites and had data, okay, for black people, or excuse me, white people in syphilis. The reason he wanted to study black people was that there was embedded in the medical literature the notion that syphilis in black people was fundamentally a different disease than syphilis in white people. The principal difference, they argued, was that in white people, syphilis attacked the neural system. In black people, it attacked the cardiovascular system. I wondered, where in the world could this idea have come from? And it's such a you know, fascinating distinction. So I dug way back in the literature, and I finally found an article written in 1874 by a, a Virginia physician that said the reason that syphilis attacks black people's cardiovascular system is that they're big, strong field hands and they have these huge hearts, you know, big, big, strong hearts. And white people, by contrast, have big brains. So there was a kind of crude reductionism at work there that if you didn't read it, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, but that was the origin of the notion. That said, that notion became very embedded in medical literature. You saw it in articles, you saw it in medical textbooks. So Clark wanted to see whether syphilis in black people would produce higher incidences of cardiovascular illness, disease. How does he sell it? Okay, he sells it by lying. He goes to the leaders of the black community, the people at Tuskegee, he goes to the groups that whose help he needs, and he tells them the truth. We want to study untreated syphilis. But the way we're going to do this 
is we're going to tell the people in the community that this is a continuation of the Rosenwald Fund syphilis control program, that we're going to be there to treat them and that we're going to be there to help them. So with that lie, okay, in hand, he begins to put together the study. I want to spend just a second to show you uh, what we're talking about, what Macon County looked like uh, in 1932. The study begins. Okay, it's a poverty, just ridden rural slum is the best way to describe it. It has disease that's endemic, uh, tuberculosis, pellagra, hookworm, all the diseases that the Rockefeller Foundation hoped they'd stamped out. We're still in Macon County. And it's all an index of poverty, people who have very, very little. That's a photograph taken in 1932 of cotton growing right up to the, to the shotgun shacks, okay, so that there's no room for a garden. That's another one. That's a guy sitting on his porch. Some of these men, by the way, wind up in the experiment. Uh, if you look at this one, uh, it's too bad the image is that faded because it would be hard to say who's more uh, emaciated, uh, the man or the mule. Uh, can you see the rib sticking out? Okay. Okay, so just think, people not getting enough to eat, people chronically ill, teeth rotting out, not enough food. Okay, those are the marks. Those are the people they want to bring into the experiment. This man, Oscar Clarence Winger, O.C. Winger, is sent down to put the study together. This man, Raymond Vondelier, is his associate. Together, they talk with all the local doctors, they explain what they're going to do, and the reason they talk with the local doctors is that they have to get them on board. They, when they put together the study group of more than 400 men, about 420 men, they create a list and they give them to the medical society in Macon County, then they convene the medical societies in Tallapoosa County, Russell County, Bullock County, all the contiguous counties, they give those medical doctors the society's list. And they say, if any of these guys come into your clinic hoping for treatment, don't treat them. Because they're in a government study to find out what happens with syphilis if you don't treat it. Okay. Well, in law, folks, that's called a conspiracy. <laughs> it means you take a group of people, you hermetically seal them inside a circle, and they can't get out. They cannot be treated because you've cut off systematically every source of treatment. Okay, that's what they do. They also need the help of someone that African Americans are going to trust. This is a black doctor. His name is Eugene Bibble. He's the head of the Andrew Hospital, okay, at the Tuskegee Institute. And so he agrees to support this experiment with the black population. I'm emphasizing this because I want you to understand that the experiment has biracial support among professionals. It's not just white docs ripping off black patients, okay? It's doctors, black and white, coming together and thinking that they have an important experiment that they want to do. This person is in many ways the linchpin figure. Her name is Eunice Rivers. She's a nurse. She's a public health nurse and she's a pioneer in the field. Her job during the Rosenwald Fund demonstrations was to give treatment. She was doing bona fide public health work. But then she's recruited to come into this experimental scientific program to withhold treatment. And her job is to make the men feel as though the doctors are there to do them good. Her job is to keep the men involved in the study. When they get ill, her job is to drive them into the Andrew Hospital so they can die at the Andrew Hospital and so autopsies can be performed so the doctors can get data clinical data with which to confirm their observations, their examination results. Without her, the experiment doesn't work. She is, depending on how you look at her, she's a Judas goat, okay, or she's a person who is involved by very, very difficult circumstances and something that she's not easy with. Okay, this is part of the lies and deceit. Uh, the men were, you know, received, uh, you know, this kind of statement. Come in, see the government doctors, last chance for special free treatment. Everybody see the word treatment? 
Okay, that's part of the lie. That's part of the lie. The men did receive treatment. This is what is so you know, bizarre about this experiment. The state health officer, a guy named Dr. Baker, when he gets wind of what's happening in Tuskegee, that there's going to be this program of studying syphilis and not treating it, he says, not on my watch. You know, my job is public health, and my job is to make sure that contagious diseases are treated. So he holds a gun to the public health service's head and extracts from them a pledge that they will give at least some treatment. Now, a lot of treatment takes a lot of time, so there, it's not going to happen. All the men in the Tuskegee syphilis experiment get a little bit of treatment. They get a few shots of neoarsphetamine, they get a few rubs of mercury, not enough to cure them, but enough to salve the conscience of the state health officer, and enough, and this is crucial, to hopelessly contaminate the experiment. If you have a little bit of treatment, it's like being a little bit pregnant. It's, it's, an, it's an impossibility. Any amount of treatment contaminates, makes bogus, a study that is supposed to be of untreated syphilis. So for the rest of this lecture, it'll be called untreated syphilis program, but now we all know that that's a lie too. It had a little bit of treatment, it was scientifically as well as morally bankrupt. Okay, uh, that's just a photograph of different doctors who cooperate. The, the black gentleman is Jerome Peters, who is a, uh, a pathologist and actually a leader in his field. There they are, uh, getting men for blood samples, uh, following people on the road, opening the trunk, doing a venipuncture, seeing how the spirochetes the, the, are cooking. Uh, they did give the men what the men thought was treatment. They gave them aspirin, okay, which was a miracle drug for them. Aspirin for aches and pains, and they gave them iron tonic to make them feel better. Uh, so the men always thought they were getting some kind of treatment and they thought the treatment would help them. Uh, all these doctors had a different thing they wanted to look at. This guy who's from the University of Miami, thinks that spirochetes encase themselves in the eye tissue, and so he's very interested in eyes. This guy thinks, oh, no, 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 we have abdominal you know, gut you know, issues with, with uh, syphilitic uh, infection. This guy is convinced that, no, no, it's luetic. It's luetic aneurysms, okay, that it's, it's, it's really involving the heart and, and vessels. Uh, I don't show the photograph. Well, I'm, I'm, I won't even go there. Uh, this is a spinal tap uh, with, with no general anesthetic. Uh, it's done with a huge 20 gauge needle. Uh, the men had to be lied to to get them in there for it. Many of them developed horrible debilitating headaches, were on their backs for days. Uh, they wanted to look at the spinal fluid. And when you have no you know, regulations against what you want to do, you do what you want to do. Uh, I want us to, I'm not going to show many of these photographs because they're grim. Uh, but I want us to know what we're talking about, okay? This is ulcerative cutaneous syphilis. It's a third stage development. Imagine that on people's faces. Imagine it on different parts of their body. I've seen it. Okay, uh, at no point is the experiment hidden. It's not a secret. There are 14 major articles published in major medical journals, including JAMA, over the history of the illness. Doctors talk about it freely among themselves. There are conferences in which they give papers, and there are big signs, and everybody knows about it within the club of medicine. Okay, uh, these, these are just examples of the publications published. John R. Heller, okay. I want to shift gears now. I want to uh, imagine a different Tuskegee study. The way this, the study worked, once they set it up in 1932, once they lied to everybody and you know, made them think they were getting help, what happened was that once a year, the government doctors would come back and conduct what they called, quote, annual roundups. And the annual roundups were to get all the men into the hospital, give them physical examinations, do spinal taps, do whatever the doctors wanted to do. And then next year, they would let them go, and until the following year, they'd come back and do it again. So think of Tuskegee as kind of the whole county, as kind of a big sick farm. People who worked on the experiment as young officers, 
in the public health service get promoted. And later, when they're in much higher jobs and have kind of line item authority on budgets and what gets done and what doesn't, they'll pull out a drawer and the drawer will have Tuskegee in it. And they'll say, oh my God, yeah, I worked on that thing in 1937, I remember it. That's a great study, we'll keep it going. That means that fresh eyes never looked at Tuskegee. Everybody who kept making decisions whether it should keep going on and on and on had been co-opted by familiarity. They had worked on it, they believed in it, there was no opportunity to stand back from it, see it from a fresh perspective. They were hostages of their original perception that the experiment was great and ought to keep going. Now, when I said I like to imagine a different scenario, it would go like this. Until 1937, five years after the experiment started, there was no real danger that the men would be treated. And there was no real danger because ignorance and poverty had decreed that they would not be treated. They didn't know they were ill or what, or specifically they were ill from, and they certainly couldn't afford treatment. But in 1937, there's a new Surgeon General of the United States, and his name is Thomas Perrin. And Perrin believed that syphilis was a scourge of the land and had to be attacked by the resources of the federal government. He wrote a book on that as part of a trumpet, you know, to get the word out. He financed mobile treatment clinics to go into the South. They were modeled after the Rosenwald Fund clinics that I talked about earlier. And they went into all the Southern communities, tested the population, and treated at federal expense patients who could not afford treatment. When those mobile clinics reached Macon County, Alabama, Nurse Rivers accompanied them. And when people would stand up in line to be tested and treated, she would say, don't treat that man. Don't treat that man. Don't treat that man. They're in the Tuskegee study, and they're not to be treated. So now we have a different situation. You could argue that until 1937, all the syphilis study did was put under a microscope for public scrutiny or scientific scrutiny a de facto situation. Now, as of 1937, that changes. There is an active denial of treatment. The second time that the Public Health Service had an opportunity to step back and rethink this was 1941, when World War I erupted and we were at war <coughs> with the Chinese, or excuse me, with the Japanese and the Germans. About one-third of the men in the Tuskegee study group, controls and syphletics, were young enough to be inducted into the armed service. The United States Public Health Service intervened with the local draft board. They gave them the names of the men in the experiment and said, do not draft these people. They didn't want them drafted for a very good reason. The armed services routinely tested new inductees for communicable diseases. And if they had syphilis, they treated them for it. So the men would have been lost to the experiment. What the public health service told the local draft board was that these men are already serving their country. They are soldiers of science. They're giving their lives now for a good scientific cause. All right, that's the second time they could have done something and did nothing. The third time was 1943. 1943, Alabama passes the Henderson Act. The Henderson Act requires the state to treat people for communicable diseases if they're medically indigent at the state's expense. Once again, the lists are put out. Don't treat these people. They're in a government study. Once again, treatment denied. During World War II, a new miracle drug is developed, penicillin. And penicillin doesn't take forever to cure syphilis. It gets the job done rapido. The men in the experiment never got penicillin. And they never got penicillin because the government had already decided that regardless of what the treatment was, they weren't going to give it to them. 
they'd already crossed the Rubicon. There was no second guessing or, gee, shouldn't we give treatment now? Once you make a decision to withhold the state-of-the-art treatment, the fact that a better treatment comes along doesn't give you pause. You stay the course. That's what they did. John R. Heller was in charge of the division. He was the division director in the 40s. I interviewed him, and I asked him about penicillin. Did you guys ever think about giving them in penicillin? And he said no. And I said, well, at the risk of, you know, belaboring the obvious, why not? He said it would have been in the study. And it was just, you know, just that matter of fact. I also asked him the next question, because this period of his stewardship, 1943 to 1948, when he's the division head, also sees Nuremberg and the Nuremberg trials and the world's awareness of the German atrocities in medical science. I asked John R. Heller whether they ever discussed the Tuskegee experiment in the light of the revelations of what the Nazi scientists had done in human experimentation. And he said no. I pressed the point. He saw where I was going. He says, are you calling me a Nazi? Is that what you're saying? You calling me a Nazi? And he threw me out of his office. You know, this, this, this interview's over, pal, get out. All right, so once again, opportunity to rethink, no deal. The next one comes in the 50s. Tuskegee is 35 miles from Montgomery, Alabama. And Montgomery, Alabama is where Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat in 1954 and where the Montgomery bus boycott starts in 1955. It's the epicenter of the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. You would think that this largest people's uprising since the American Revolution, this demanding of African Americans for rights that will close the gap between what they were promised in the Declaration of Independence and the reality of Jim Crow, you would think that Tuskegee would give people pause when suddenly African Americans are pushing back hard. Instead, all it does is make the doctors a little bit scary, a little bit skitty. They say, well, maybe now is not a good time to publish this article. You know, maybe we should wait a year or two and see if things kind of calm down. The problem is that they see it as a political problem. They never define it as a moral, ethical disaster. They don't internalize the ethic of wrongdoing. They just see that, well, there may be hell to pay, okay? So the experiment chugs along, and the opportunities to rethink it go, uh, oh, this is, you know, love this. Uh, at the 25-year mark, they give all the people in the experiment the certificate and $25, a buck a year, for making the experiment. All right. In 19, let me get this guy. This is the man I want, Peter Buxton. He's our whistleblower. Peter works at the Hunt Street Clinic in uh, San Francisco. All he does is just kind of, you know, do epidemiological work on patients, follow up work, gets them in for treatment. He's doing a paper, a research paper for a graduate professor, and he comes across stuff on the Tuskegee study. And he can't believe it. He cannot believe that it's going on. So he complains to his professor, and he complains to his boss in the public health service, and I'm gonna collapse a lot of stuff here, because boy did he complain for a long time to a lot of people. He just, keeps, he just keeps complaining and complaining and complaining, and finally, after two years of writing letters and being a, you know, just a thorn in everybody's side, they fly him out to the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, and he meets with about 12 very high-ranking public health service officers, and they beat the socks off him. They tell him, you're not a doctor. Quit raising all this stink. You don't understand. You're not a white coat. You know, you're a social worker. Shut up. It's good science. It's good medicine. And quit being, you know, a scold. They send him home. So they send him home, and, you know, he licks his wounds. In about two weeks, ego rallies, and he writes a remarkable letter. He writes back to the director of the Center for Disease Control, David Sensor, and he says, you know, you're right, I'm not a doctor, I'm, you know, I don't com 
say that I am. He said, but I know a moral problem when I see one. You guys have put in motion and have kept going an experiment that has killed people. You're responsible for that. It's still going on. I don't know, he said, if a jury would talk murder one, but I'm pretty sure they'd talk murder two. And when he wrote that letter, suddenly he got their attention. <laughs> they thought, well, maybe, maybe there might be consequences if the public finds out what we're doing. So in 1969, I'm going to go back, they held a panel and they had like 20 people. 19 of the 20 had worked on the experiment and they asked them what they thought of the experiment and they all thought, well, it's great, it ought to keep going. <laughs> the one who didn't say it was great is this gentleman. He was a cephalogist from Vanderbilt University, a heavy hitter in the field, and he said in the meeting, whoa, whoa, I have problems. I've got big problems. I don't care what you say about the science, I don't care what you say or what you think you're learning, this doesn't pass a nose test. So this stinks. I'm no part of it. And he refused, he was the one dissenting vote. But the other people of the group say, well, we still think it's good science, we still think it should keep going. And so what they do is decide to put more resources in to get better statisticians, to clean up the data, to try to get better scientific articles, and they all want to just keep it going. All right, it would have kept going, except for, now we're gonna go back again, our friend Peter Buxton, because Peter resurfaces. He's like, you know, a Diogenes honest man. He's, you know, looking, you know, he's got that lamp and he just keeps kind of poking around. He left the public health service, he went to law school, he tried to interest his professors in law school, they all said, harumph, young man, stirring up litigation, the statute of limitations has run out, you have evidentiary problems, there's nothing you can do. Well, Peter finally figured out what he could do. He had a girlfriend, and his girlfriend was named Edith Letterer. And Edie was a reporter for the Associated Press. <laughs> And she was the head of their Far Eastern office, and she was in San Francisco for some R&R, &R, and they have a date, and then they have Chinese food, and they go to his place, and they're eating, and he starts telling her about Tuskegee, and her mouth falls open. He says, can you possibly be telling the truth? So he goes over, and he gets out a stack of those articles I showed you, you know, just a minute ago, the titles and they start reading them. They all begin with the same preamble. This is a longitudinal study of the effects of untreated syphilis in a group of African-American males in the rural South, or in Macon County, Alabama. No effort to disguise. So Edie calls her boss at the, at the AP and says, have I got a story? And her boss says, no you don't. You're going back to the Far East where you're our bureau chief in Japan and I'm gonna give the story to someone else. He gives it to a woman named Jean Heller. Jean Heller in 1972 breaks the story. And once the story is broken, all hell breaks loose. The Public Health Service is in the ridiculous position of trying to defend what it can't. And the crawfishing that you see is just unbelievable. One guy points here, one guy points there. One guy says, oh no, he did it, he did it. And there's no place to hide. So in the wake of public outrage, the Public Health Service announces finally in 1972 that the experiment's over. They stop it. Then, as the hue and cry of public outrage gets louder, the pressure on the government to do something more intensifies. At that point, they say, well, maybe we have a responsibility to the men in this study. But there's a lot of, lot of back and forth on that. So this person enters the scene. His name's Fred Gray. Fred Gray is an African-American attorney, okay? And those of you who know a lot about the Civil Rights Movement will make another association. He was Rosa Parks' attorney in 1954. He was Martin Luther King's attorney in 1955. 
He was the head of the NAACP office when he was a young, very young man in Montgomery, Alabama. And history placed him at the center of, of, the, of the civil rights movement. He's also a remarkable man. He swore he's a very deep, devoted Christian. He's a member of the Church of Christ. He's an ordained minister, as well as being an outstanding attorney. He swore an oath when he was a child that when he grew up, he would use every ounce of his strength and his intelligence to destroy everything that had segregation written on it. That was his life's mission. And he did. Fred argued, has three major Supreme Court decisions that he won on gerrymandering in the South. He was the second black legislator from Alabama since Reconstruction. He has all the quiet confidence of a Christian holding four aces. He's that kind of guy. <laughs> He's also a person who doesn't quit. I would rather have a bear after me than Fred Gray. A bear might get tired. A bear might decide to eat somebody else. <laughs> but Fred Gray, if he's after you, <laughs> you're going to wind up in his stomach because that man is a force of nature. I had the good fortune to work with Fred Gray because I had documents that he needed for the case, uh, to make his case in court, and I gave him my documents, and then I went to work with him on this case, and it was one of the great privilege privileges of my life. Uh, you know, to, to be able to serve what I thought was history and justice. Kennedy held hearings on Tuskegee, okay? And in the light of those hearings, the public outrage increased. The government decided to settle the case out of court, and they gave a settlement to the uh, men who survived and to the estates of those who did not survive. And Tuskegee at that point was supposed to go away, but it didn't. Instead, Tuskegee became the discussion ground level for new policies regulating human experimentation. It was decided that all institutions that received federal funds, hospitals, universities, didn't matter. If you got federal bucks, you had to have something called an IRB, an Institutional Review Board. And they had to look at all protocols for studies, experiments, any kind of science, anything that could touch people had to be able to pass muster with regard to ethical soundness. So that was the first big policy payoff of Tuskegee and it remains huge today. But the legacy wasn't done. In the African American community, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment became a very, very sore and open wound. When African Americans looked at Tuskegee, they did not see it through the lens of 1932 to 1972. They saw it through a much bigger lens, and that was called the history of race relations. That history began with capture in Africa. It began with the horrors of the middle voyage being transported as chattel property to the South and to plantations. It began with the horror of American Negro slavery, when a race of people was subjugated and made to do labor without pay. They saw it through the lens of the Civil War, when slavery was supposed to end and 40 acres and a mule would be the day of Jubilee. That didn't happen. They saw it through the lens of Jim Crow, when the South devised a series of laws, every one more pernicious than the one that preceded it, to completely lower, then lower again, and then lower again, degradation of how African Americans were treated. You can't go to school, you can't sit in this theater, you can't vote, lower and lower goes the field. Concerns, you have to understand where they're coming from, and you gotta be part of the solution of rebuilding that trust. Okay, I was a member of a group of academics who pressured the White House to issue a formal apology for the Tuskegee study because that had never been done. African Americans had died in an experiment that they could have been saved from. And Bill Clinton, much to his credit, 
That's Charlie Pollard. He was the, he was the plaintiff. He was the named plaintiff on the suit against the government. Uh, it's Pollard et al. versus the United States. That's Charlie Pollard, wonderful man. That's Herman Shaw. Herman Shaw is another survivor. Eloquent, eloquent. Uh, his son is a high school principal. And if you want to see a proud daddy, uh, talk to Herman Shaw about, about his boy. Uh, that's me. <laughs> Mugging it up, okay, that's at, the, that's at President Clinton's apology. When President Clinton apologized, I worked with the staff that wrote the apology and I offered to write it for him. Uh, and I was very glad I didn't because what they wrote was much better than anything I could have, I could have turned out. But it was a joyous day because I thought that with the President's apology, which was heartfelt, warm, and I think taken with great gratitude by the survivors, I thought that was the beginning of the healing process. Thank you. <laughs> nurse Rivers knew everything. Okay, the public health nurse who is involved with the experiment, spends her whole career with it, knew exactly what was going on. Now that's the short answer to your question. Okay, the longer issue is, why did she do it? You know, how could she, how could she cooperate with it? When I wrote Bad Blood, the figure in the book that interested me most was Nurse Rivers. I saw the doctors, frankly, as kind of wooden and one-dimensional. You know, they had this idea, they thought they could do it, and there was, you know, they, they thought that wanting to do it was self-validating, so they did it. But the person who I thought had texture and complexity uh, was Nurse Rivers. And uh, truth, truth in telling here, uh, my grandmother, who was as much a mother to me as my own mom, was a practical nurse. And I grew up listening to, to practical nurses talk about the docs, you know, in this little hospital where they work. And a lot of what I think I understand about medicine, they taught me, okay. So, and I have a soft spot in my heart for nurses. Okay, when, when I published Bad Blood, a friend of mine who's an African-American historian called me on the phone and he was just apoplectic. I mean, he was just in a rage. He hated Nurse Rivers. I'm holding the phone out here because it hurts my ear to get any closer. He's screaming at me. He says, the trouble with you, Jones, is that you're a goddamn racial liberal. He said, you're a guilty southerner, and you don't know evil when you see it. He said, that bitch was evil. <laughs> and how can you make out otherwise? You know, you're just, you know, you're just pulling punches, pal, was what he told me. And I told him, I said, okay, I can't. You know, I can't really go there. Uh, I've got a different, you know, perspective on her. So I gave him my, my Nurse Rivers spiel. Okay, here's the spiel. Nurse Rivers is the child of a sharecropper, an illiterate, unlettered man. The sharecropper makes a crop and he works in a local sawmill to make extra money. His wife dies leaving him with three small girls. There are no black schools where he lives, so the girls can't get an education. He sends them to his sister's home over in Jenkins, Georgia, where there's a black school segregated that will give them up to an eighth grade education. When they finish that eighth grade education, Nurse Rivers, Eunice Rivers, okay, is the oldest girl, and she's supposed to be what my grandmother would call the bell cow. She's supposed to lead the way and, you know, be the pioneer and the other girls will follow her. He insists, her daddy, uh, I mean, there's so many good stories about her daddy. Her daddy couldn't read. And he would make her show him her report cards. He, but he, he knew what an A was <laughs> and he knew what a B was. And if she got Bs, she got hell. <laughs> he wanted A's. I mean, he pushed those kids hard. He sent her to Tuskegee, and the first year she kind of messed around with like, you know, uh, uh, some kind of uh, craft uh, uh, for training. It was, you know, they had a lot of industrial arts. Not good enough, Dad says. You gotta have a profession. So she shifts over to nursing, and she's the number one graduate in her class. She just is a fine, exceptionally strong, you know, student. The head of, the program is the guy Dibble I showed you, Eugene Dibble, the black doctor who's head of the Andrew Hospital. Well, he's her mentor. 
When his wife gets appendicitis in 1919, and it should have killed her, they pull her through, but the nurse that he selects to hold her hand and care for her during that grave illness is Nurse Rivers. So that tells you everything about his confidence in her. He gets her a job working for the state of Alabama. She is the first African-American woman hired by the state to be in the newly created Division of Colored Health in the state of Alabama. She is teamed up with two other workers, an ag worker and a home ec worker. And the three of them get in their car and they go to all these rural communities and they do demonstrations. The ag worker teaches them how to grow a garden, people how to grow a nice garden. The home ec worker teaches them how to cook nutritious food. Nurse Rivers' job is to do elementary obstetrics and gynecology and to try to get them to be interested in hygiene and those sort of things. Well, that's a pioneering job. I mean, it's a big, big thing to desegregate anything in Alabama, okay, let alone you know, a health department. She does that for the better part of 10 years. And then when the stock market collapses, the state cuts that budget for black health. And so she doesn't have a job. So what her mentor, Eugene Dibble, does is he creates a job for her. He throws her a lifeline to keep her active professionally. He makes her the director of night nursing <laughs> at the Andrew Hospital. And that's where she is when the Public Health Service and the Rosenwald Fund come in and want to do those treatment programs, those syphilis control demonstrations I talked about. Well, she shines in that. I mean, she's a brilliant person with patients. She just has wonderful rapport. So the docs like her and the patients love her. And when the Rosenwald Fund demonstrations end, you know, she goes back to be, being director of night nursing because that's the only job. And then when the Public Health Service comes back to do the Tuskegee study, they need a nurse again, and they say, what about Nurse Rivers? Eugene Dibble says, good news, I got a job for you again. You're gonna work for the Public Health Service. And he really pumps, up, pumps it up. And then he gives her what I call the Jackie Robinson pitch. You are the best we have. Whatever they ask you to do, you can do. And you will cast a happy reflection on our training program and on your race. So she takes the job. Now she gets in this job and they're not treating people. Okay, and she has some problems with that. But she reminds herself, what was I taught in nursing school? You don't prescribe. You don't diagnose, you follow the doctor's orders. And my mentor has told me this is important work. The next thing, Tuskegee does not fill all of her life. She has long periods when she can do bona fide public health work. I asked her, I said, when you weren't working on the experiment, did you have extra time? She said, oh yeah. She said the experiment never took more than half of my time. She said, for the rest of my time, I got to do public health work. And I said, well, what did, what did you do? And she said, well, she says, I was minding my mamas, my old folks, and my babies. Okay, she cared for people. She gave bona fide health work. And I think in her mind, the two people melded. Yeah, she was the nurse on Tuskegee. But yeah, she was the nurse that cared for everybody. She begged clothes. She worked like a social worker. She did so many kindnesses for so many people. When we were driving around, uh, I spent three days with her in a car, driving in all the small communities outside of Tuskegee where they would meet the men. And uh, this one place, we came out, of a, came out of a stand of timber and then into an open field that was cotton, and there was a shotgun shack at the edge of that cotton, and there was an old man. You know, and she says, Dr. Jones, stop the car. So I stop the car and she gets out and the old man whose hair is as white as you know, snow and he's got cataracts that you can almost see. I mean, he's just, he's just a beautiful old, old man. And he's got a cane and he sees her through those cataracts and he starts yelling at the top of his lungs, Nurse Rivers, Nurse Rivers. And she starts going toward him 
and he goes toward her, and they hug each other. There's this wonderful, warm embrace. And he says to her, he says, Nurse Rivers, why you don't come back? You are nurse, why you don't come back no more? And she says, shut up, be quiet, be quiet, Ned. You got the money, you got that settlement, you can't have the money in me too. <laughs> And I'm thinking, Lord God, what do I do with this, <laughs> you know, as a story and as a complex human response? He knew exactly what she'd done. He loved her. I had people in the experiment that I interviewed, subjects in the experiment. For them, the heartbreaking part was Nurse Rivers because they couldn't understand why she did it. I wrote Nurse Rivers three times. The first version I wrote of that chapter, I wrote, put down, and then read weeks later. And I recognized the nurse. Big nurse, Nurse Ratchet from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, a perfect monster. Many of you haven't seen One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? Watch it. It is a powerful film. I put that version of her down, laid it to rest because it got out all the anger in me. I took every shot I had at her and I just, you know, gave her what for. Then I wrote the chapter again. I put it down, I let it rest, I came back to it. The pendulum swung to the other extreme. I was in the presence of Florence Nightingale. <laughs> Nurse Rivers was, you know, more of a saint than myself, so I put it down. The third version I wrote is a resting place for me. It's the chapter I wrote in the book. And in that chapter, I try to deal with moral ambiguity. I try to deal with a person who did awful things and thought she was doing good. I try to you know, see things through a human context. Where Nurse Rivers got inside my soul was as we were parting that last day after I'd interviewed her. I could tell she didn't want me to leave, didn't want me to leave the room, so I just stayed. And after what seemed like an eternity of silence, but it was only a couple of minutes, I'm sure, she was sitting on her couch, behind her on the couch, on the wall, a photograph of Martin Luther King, a framed copy of the Florence Nightingale play, her life raised in medical service. And her body started to shake, her lips shivering, tears running down her cheeks. She says, oh, she says, oh, Dr. Jones. We should have told those men they had syphilis. And God knows we should have treated them. Well, you know, it's hard for a person who's lived their life doing one thing to have that kind of moment of, of you know, repentance. And she's the only person in the experiment who conducted it, was in any way responsible for it, who has expressed one iota of contrition. I think she understood that much of her life was moral suicide. And I think she was bone sorry she did it. So when my friend tells me I can't pull the trigger and you know, declare that she's awful, that's why. Uh, you know, I see, I see a, uh, a woman with a very complex, a very complex situation. <laughs>